So ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for St. Tony for inviting me. Let's get into it. That is yours truly when I was about, what, nine, ten years old. My mother thought I was the most handsome boy. I still like to think so. Let me ask the ladies. Am I still, uh, okay, don't answer that question. <laughs> Here's one thing my mother told me. She gave me so much wisdom and advice, which I'm going to share with you. She said, Derek, if you want to be a professional, she was very keen and strict on time. You have got to maintain time. We were supposed to start this event at 10 o'clock. Waidaka started this event at 10 o'clock. Well done. This room was not as full as it is. But my point is, she said, you have to have the right tools or device in order to manage your time. And ladies and gentlemen, the right tool or device is usually worn on the left or the right wrist. It is called a watch. So can I see the serious professionals? Come on, I know I'm corner. Serious professionals versus jokers. How in I'm calling you jokers. And if you raise a mobile phone, you're only a joker, you're a loser. I'm here to tell you the truth. I'm not here to make friends. Let's get serious with life, Kenyans. This event is supposed to start at 10. Okay, let me not, uh, it's not a training. All right. So when I was young, I loved the superhero genre. I still do. I love superhero comic books. I love superhero movies. Who's your favorite superhero? I mean, there's a superhero for every day of the week. Who's your favorite superhero? Iron Man. Okay, Iron Man. Ladies will say Thor. You get it. I mean, they're there. Oh, cool. My favorite superhero, believe it or not, was the Invisible Woman. And you know why? Because I wanted to be invisible. I wanted to be able to sneak into my sister's room see what she was up to every time she slammed the door. When my parents chased me upstairs because they were having an argument, I wanted to be able to creep down and listen to what they were saying. But also the reason I wanted to be invisible is because growing up, I did not want to be seen. I did not want to be heard. I did not want to be remembered. I wanted to hide at the back of the class. I didn't want to sit in front right here. I wanted to sit at the back of the class. You get where I'm going. I was an extreme extrovert. Not extreme, but I was pretty shy. Now, fast forward, obviously, 20-something um, odd years later, and guess what? <laughs> my job is anything but invisible. I mean, look at my job. To stand in front of a room full of, you know, people. And not only that, this is the most visible in terms of careers that I'm doing. My job is actually to help my clients my clients to be seen, to be heard, and to be remembered for the right reasons. That's my banner. Those are some of the areas that we cover. So it's sort of come full circle where I was as a young man and where I am today, which is being visible. And I'm sure my is going to come here and talk up a little bit more about that. I'm not going to focus too much on that today. I want to focus on something else. So um, also just to let you know, I am a what I'm going to say up here is not the gospel truth. I've had years of experience, yes. But believe you me, for every, <laughs> for every step I've taken forward, or every two steps I've taken forward, I've taken one step back. I mean, it's been a journey of learning, learning from mistakes, through businesses, through, and I'm still learning. I'm learning for these wonderful speakers here. I'm learning from you guys. So your journey, your journey, your career, is going to be up and down. It's, it's never perfect. We're trying to get there. But just to let you know, the people who come up here and speak who are professionals, don't look at them and say, my God, I wish I was there. People are going through their own trials. Okay, so I'm just giving you that. And what I'm going to share with you might not be for everybody. It's my considered viewpoint, given what I do, but this is something that you have to decide for yourself. All right, let's see. Let me just sort of introduce this topic by talking about the fourth industrial revolution. Has anybody not heard of the fourth industrial revolution? Okay, I'm sure you all have. You know. Fourth industrial revolution, that's arguably what people say we're going through, right? So obviously this is digitalization, it is automation, it is big data, it is robotics, Artificial intelligence, in fact, I give a talk on artificial intelligence linked to emotional intelligence, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and how you need certain skills, ladies and gentlemen, to succeed in this day and age that we're in. You need them. There are no two ways about it. Or you're going to be left behind. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, 
There's a list there. You know the World Economic Forum. They meet every year, Davos, Switzerland, the most powerful men and women in the world. And typically, amongst discussing the things that are going to challenge this planet, climate change, world trade, they put out a list of skills that you need to succeed in this brave new world. And these lists are projected forward. So they put out these lists of the skills that you need in three years, in four years, in five years. And if you look, I have that list up there. And in fact, if we can drill down just a little bit more into it, you will see that the skills that you need, and we're just projecting out in 2022, but this is the fourth industrial revolution that we're talking about, this automation, this big data. I mean, check this out. Look at the skills that I've highlighted some of them. There you go, emotional intelligence, all right? Uh, creativity, okay? Leadership and social influence. By the way, that list, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't include anything to do with digitalization, which, you know, would be surprising, given that's what the fourth industrial revolution is. But what these experts are saying is that because of this extreme automation, we need to be able, in order to succeed, and this extreme automation has brought about where pretty much things can be done by machines. Think about it, right? Your systems at work are automated. Going to the doctor, talking to a customer service professional, all of these things have become automated. And so your jobs, ladies and gentlemen, might be in danger of disappearing. In fact, let's talk a little bit more about that. Now, again, I don't want to sound the alarm. And you will find people who say, you know what, automation actually is going to create more jobs. Well, I'm, I'm of the camp that certain jobs might need some help. Now, my next two slides are actually not mine. There was a gentleman who spoke at this forum, I believe, two years ago by the name of Peter Ndwati. But I was so taken by what he came up with. The World Economic Forum comes up with the list of jobs that they're saying you need to change. We're going to be disrupted. But Peter Nduati came up here and he talked about jobs that are going to be disrupted up here, Kenya, which is why I thought was interesting. Because all the lists I've seen are sort of jobs that, you know what, I don't necessarily believe that's going to happen here in Kenya. So um, I don't know, was anybody, did anybody attend that talk? I mean, obviously, other than the Centonomy team. Anybody attend that talk? Okay, so I'm going to show you some of these these jobs. By the way, I love this slide because you know what this slide reminds me of? Thanos. Remember? If you watch the Avengers, right? So your jobs, what, is, what was Thanos' move? What was his power move? <laughs> You're gone. So <laughs> this is happening. Okay, let's take a list of those jobs. Okay, now again, I'm not going to talk about these in detail. You can, you can, um, you can get this talk on YouTube. Um, but just to mention some of them, I thought it might be interesting because these are the jobs people are saying are being disrupted and if you don't bring in things like emotional intelligence, creativity and some of these other skills, um, your careers might vanish. Now, to be fair, we can have a conversation about each of these jobs for an hour. But let me just, in the hopes of getting you involved, is there a job up there that you would like to ask me why it is on that list. Just, you know, we don't need to wait until the end of this conversation to, for you to ask me questions. Is there one job there and you're like, wait, wait, why is my job on that list? <laughs> okay, anybody? Yes, sir. Why is insurance on that list? It's simple, it's automation. Now, it's not all jobs in insurance, but it is the jobs of possibly brokers. It's the jobs of how um, insurance these days is about not you coming to my door and selling, but I can simply go online and I can look at competing quotes. There are actually companies that are, that are doing that. And I don't need the traditional insurance agent to come to my office and try to sell me the insurance. I think that's what um, is happening in the insurance agency. And I'm not an expert, but I believe the automation is taking over. Does that... So what, what do you do in insurance, if you don't mind my asking? You're, you're an insurance broker. <laughs> but this talk is going to help you because instead of being caught flat-footed in five years, you're going to have to be able to position yourself so that your job remains relevant, right? Okay, uh, again, I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but I thought it's interesting. 
um, in light of what I'm going to talk about. All right, let's see if we can move on. Is this working or is somebody moving this? All right, here's the thing. I would like you to turn around and have a two, three minute conversation with your neighbor or your colleague and ask them, is your job a calling or is it a job? Is your work a calling or is it a job? Just have a two minute conversation. Is it a calling? Amani. Ayaba. Milazma. Just have that conversation. To the meat of my, my conversation here with you today. There is a book which I would advise everybody in this room to read. It's by Cal Newport. And it is called So Good, They Can't Ignore You. Anybody read this book? By the way, take a look at the subtitle. Why, what trumps what? Skills trump passion. By the way, those are my three favorite words there. Trump? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> skills and passion. I'm joking. Why skills trump passion? Now, controversial. In fact, Carl Newport in his book lays out the case for the fact that there is what is called the passion myth. I don't want to approach it from that binary point of view where it's either passion or skills and talent. But I'm going to try and open your eyes because yes, speaker after speaker, and I watched a lot of the Centonomy videos, just <laughs> everybody says, find your what? Passion. Find your passion, find your passion, find your passion. I'm gonna try and make the case where, not necessarily, I say not necessarily, I said, I don't wanna be binary but perhaps it's about skills and talent before passion. In fact, his examples in his book, Carl Newport, and he also has an interesting story, but I love the example he uses of Steve Jobs. How many people were aware that Steve Jobs' true passion in life was not computers? Does anybody know what his true passion in life, when he graduated from university, what he started doing, and what he loved to do the most? This guy <laughs> was into Eastern philosophy and religion. In fact, had the world been different, maybe on another universe, there's a Steve Jobs who didn't set up <laughs> the most successful company, certainly by market cap in the world, but instead is teaching Eastern religion <laughs> at a community college. Because that's what Steve Jobs wanted to do. He did not want to set up an organization or a company that has changed our lives. We can't even imagine our lives without Apple products. But his interest mm, couldn't take him so far. His talent, coding, selling, got him to set up Apple. And I mean, I love that story. I wish we had time to talk more about it, but it's one of the examples that Carl Newport uses in his book. Okay, let's move on. Now, um, I, have a, I, so, I sort of want to break it down like this where the first thing we're gonna talk about is a craftsman mindset. That is what, ladies and gentlemen, I believe all of us need to start developing. And a craftsman is somebody who works so well and so good at what they do that they're leading themselves to be so good that they can't be ignored. So I took that unscientific poll, a lot of people, one year, two years. How did you pick your job? Was it what was available, I think this is my passion. Even now, start finding out what am I good at. And you can find that out a variety of ways in terms of what you're good at. By the way, assessment tests, I believe in those, talent, personality, emotional intelligence, I run a lot of those tests, to see what you're geared to and start looking for those opportunities. Maybe your first job that maybe a lot of you have over here is a job where, you know what, I'm not even really happy at this particular job, but I'm just taking it because I'd rather be here than unemployed. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, what's my passion? What's my passion? What do I really want to do? Hold your horses. Stick at that job for a while. And in fact, I'm gonna explain a little bit further because who knows, you might become good at it. Or at least reposition your role within that organization such that you can do the same thing but you're doing something that clearly that's where your talent lies. Uh, I started working at a company called Bloomberg, which is in the US. I was fortunate enough, I got a job there, I graduated from university. My job at Bloomberg was a financial analyst, business analyst, whatever they call it. 
Um, but I, I sort of began to realize that my talent actually lay in going to customers and talking to bankers on Wall Street, you know, talking to equity traders in Boston, and sitting down and explaining to them how things work. And I realized that my talent didn't lay in number crunching and doing analytics behind a machine, but in connecting like this, Anakwana, and people were responding, even though we're talking about figures, okay? And then I started kind of working on that. I'm actually going to share that journey a little bit more. All right, let's move on. Craftsman Weinsman. What can you offer the world? What can you offer the company? Okay. Carl Newport talks about building career capital. Now, building career capital is where you've moved. You're still the craftsman mindset, but you're now sort of beginning to be the go-to person within that organization. Or as an entrepreneur, people start recognizing you. This gentleman here, Mwenesi. <laughs> you know, Mwenesi, I don't know if you know this. I actually happen to no members of your family, but I didn't know you. But all of a sudden, I started seeing videos popping up on YouTube. I'm saying, who is this guy in my competition? <laughs> this guy is here building career capital with a rare and valuable skill of being able to stand here and change the world. Beginning to be noticed. The higher-ups are beginning to notice you. Okay? Or if you're running your own business, you're beginning to kind of make a dent in terms of market share. Okay, again, let me go back because I'm talking to an audience that might be looking at career hopping. And again, I haven't taken a poll here. But you say, you know what? I'm bored with this. Let me move to this. Ah, actually, I like this. Ah. I would caution that. I would start saying, okay, fine. I am hired as an auditor, junior accountant. What can I do as a junior accountant that actually makes me stand out as different from other accountants? Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Am I talking to somebody? Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, all right, let's see if we can move on. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're looking for, and let me just uh, hit this one more time. Guys, if we can hit it there, is these three things. Creativity, impact, and control. Creativity, which remember, is one of the skills that you need to survive in this fourth industrial revolution, is where you can change your industry to such an extent that it is not how it used to be. There is a group of accountants in the US called cliffhangers. And you know why they're called cliffhangers? Because accounting is your regular job. You go, you audit, work on somebody's taxes, but these guys are actually carving out a niche for themselves because in addition to the accounting services, they're offering things like consulting, training, an accountant. And even some are specializing to only deal with certain people. So they are what we call creative accountants. They only do accounts for people in the creative industry, web designers, people in the advertising or media space, because they speak their language. And what they're able to do is narrow down the number of clients that they work with so that they can charge a premium because they're offering services that connect. There's that emotional intelligence and leadership with the people in that particular industry. Think of what you're doing right now. What can you do to begin specializing or changing what you do or as an entrepreneur so that it, you're kind of going from being a generalist to being a specialist, carving out your niche. Niche? Ni niche? I'm a niche. One of those two. Okay. Uh, so that's a creativity. Impact and control is where impact, you're clearly making a difference. You're clearly standing out. You're making an impact with your target market. You're making an impact in the market. You make an impact in the company. You make an impact as an entrepreneur. And control is now where you now begin to start taking control of your life. So instead of having to clock in at 8 o'clock to show the boss that you're working, you can show up at 11 because the boss knows you're so good, you are not going to get fired. Now, I'm not saying that gives you license to behave unprofessionally. But you have a certain amount of control. You can tell the boss, you know what? Don't worry. I got this. And the boss knows you're so good. You've developed this career capital. Sawatu. Ama, you want to work from home today? It's okay. I know you're not hanging out watching Maria. You're actually working, right? <laughs> because you've, you've, built, <laughs> you've built your craft. Are we together, guys? By the way, I have to be honest. This where you have deliberate practice and all of these things are linked, is generally where most entrepreneurs are going. Now again, I'm not saying quit your job, but this is especially geared 
to people who want to set up your own business. That's the control you have. Choose your clients. <laughs> make your calendar. Choose who you work with. Can you imagine saying, I don't want to deal with all of these people and I only want to deal with these people and still be able to make money. In fact, charge a premium. Do you get where I'm going? Okay. Uh, let me just move on. So that passion is actually there. But that passion, instead of being here, find your passion, then work your way to being good. It's actually there. True passion comes when you have developed your craft, when you can stand up here and change the world through the power of your words. This is what I love to do. It wasn't what I set out to do at all. I set out to do spreadsheets and analytics. But then I discovered, actually, I have a talent from being able to speak in front of audiences. And I've developed it. You get what I'm saying? Now, it's not binary. I'm not saying don't follow your passion. But find your talent. And if your talent and passion mix, beautiful. Okay? But sometimes your passion might not be good. <laughs> My true passion, do you want to know? Health and fitness. I would love to be a fitness instructor. Actually, I don't know if I'd be good at it. <laughs> I'm crazy. Special coffee I drink, what eat, food I eat. People say, like, who are you? I mean, I am a very difficult and picky sort of person to go to a, a restaurant with. But I'm really careful about what goes into my body. I'm, I'm really passionate about that. But does my talent lie in being a dietitian or a nutritionist or a fitness instructor? I don't know. I don't think so. I think my talent lies in, in what I'm doing over here. By the way, this freedom... That's freedom, freedom to choose assignments, freedom to choose projects, freedom to tell your boss, you know what, I'll work on this. Freedom to tell your boss, you know what, double my salary or else. You know what I'm saying? Because you're so good, they can't what? Ignore you. Sawasaw. Niendele ama niendele. All right, let me move on to the next slide. I'm not even controlling them. Somebody's there. Um, by the way, that's true autonomy. Okay, so um, let's just move forward. I want to come to hit it once. There we go. So we have expertise on this graph and years in your career. So I asked you how long you've been working. One, two, three, four, five years. By the way, I love my job so much. I, I've discovered my true passion. I'm going to do this until I drop dead. I'm going to do it till I'm 95. This thing of retiring at 60, I can't even imagine. What am I going to do when I'm 60? I'm going to keep doing this until I drop on stage or somebody drops me, whichever comes first. Okay? But what I have done and we can hit the next slide, is that, uh, and let's just hit one more. Okay, and hit one more, and hit one more. Okay, just leave it there. So, generally what happens with people's careers is that they will start a job, and they're not so excited about it. Maybe they move on from junior staff to middle management, and maybe you become a senior manager working for a bank. But all the while, you sort of remain a generalist. What Cal Newport is saying is that if you want to be so good, they can't ignore you. At some point in your career, you've got to start narrowing down to your specialty. Narrowing down to your specialty within the organization. In fact, I was listening to somebody talk about HR, and I didn't realize that there's so many specialist roles within HR itself. You know, I thought HR is just a generalist role. Payroll, dealing with staff issues, but there are specialist roles within that. And by the way, the right fit, the right organization, you will see truly your career take off, your salary quadruple, or as an entrepreneur. We're there, a lot of us, standing up here and talking about personal branding and motivation. But I, I and again, I'll share with you my journey. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to carve down the niche where I am, this is the guy amongst three people within the country who can talk about this. Okay? Uh, and by the way, this area here is the risk that you take. Because sometimes, here's what some people do. So you've been working in this role, you know, and again, I just use your role of an accountant, okay? And you decide, you know what, I, this job sucks. Really, my side hustle is selling mangoes, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quit my job, 
okay, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to focus full time on selling mangoes because that's where my passion is, in farming or, you know, selling produce. But guess what happens? Your career actually goes back here. Remember that career capital that you built as an accountant for five or ten years, which you maybe didn't like so much, but you were actually pretty good at it because you never got fired. You go back to here. And then you have to start working all this way again to develop, to become the, <laughs> the top mango seller in Kenya. So think before you make certain decisions. Don't just say passion there. And then you drop it after one year. And then, you know, <laughs> think about what you're good at. What you can develop. And then that will clearly, hopefully, be able to make you money. Okay, let's just move on to the next slide. Um, oh, <laughs> Don't take my word for it. Would you take the word of this lady? She's built some career capital. Let's listen to what Oprah has to say. Your job is not always going to fulfill you. There will be some days that you just might be bored. Other days, you may not feel like going to work at all. Go anyway. And remember that your job is not who you are. It's just what you're doing on the way to who you will become. Every, 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 every remedial chore, every boss who takes credit for your ideas, that is going to happen. Look for the lessons because the lessons are always there. And the number one lesson I can offer you where your work is concerned is this. Become so skilled, so vigilant, so flat out fantastic at what you do that your talent cannot be dismissed. Okay, thank you. So that's taken from a recent commencement speech she gave. I like that last part. Become so flat out good that you cannot be dismissed. That's where you're so good that they can't, they can't ignore you. So um, I, I want to maybe share with you my journey and show you how I have made the right steps and also taking missteps in this journey to becoming so good that they can't ignore me. By the way, how long has it taken for Santonomy to call me to give this talk? Okay, that's a conversation for another day. I'm kidding. All right, let's go. So my first, um, first job, as I mentioned, I worked for a company called Bloomberg. Business analyst, financial analyst, generalist, dealing with clients across the whole spectrum, whatever. But as I told you, I started developing this knack where I could actually, it was sending me out to clients. Um, sending me to, to, to Wall Street, sending me to these equity uh, portfolio managers, training them on the Bloomberg system. And if you know anything about the Bloomberg system, it provides data, it provides analytics, it provides financial news to people who are in the financial industry. And I sort of became the go-to guy to sort of do, not, there, there were trainings in a way, but rather than just sitting at my desk and doing um, sort of the, 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 the regular analytics. Okay. My next job, so this was in the US, I decided, you know what, this job is actually, um, I think I'm actually not too bad at it, but I, I, I think I want to develop more within the financial industry, so I went and I got my MBA. Now I got my MBA in communications, and, um, I, I, and I, I said to myself, if you want to be able to become better in your career, this is what you sort of need to, to get as a, as a, as a qualification. Okay, now again, this is not to say that you have to get these additional qualifications, but to me to be able to specialize within my industry, I needed to have this particular qualification. It's not necessary for all sorts of jobs. Okay, my next job then was working for Africa Practice, based here in Kenya. So I decided to come back to Kenya, long story, and, um, and work in something called strategic communications. Now this actually had nothing to do with finance. Yes, it was related to communications, but I was doing a lot of PR work, working with government, working with companies that were based abroad, Diageo, who had a footprint in Africa and helping them develop their strategic comms, okay? Now, within that role, again, I sort of said, okay, what can I do that makes me stand out within this industry? It's not related to finance, it is in the communications industry. So guess what? I decided to set up public image. Public image, where now I was actually teaching these communication skills. 
Remember, I had built some capital because I had been training when I'd been here at Bloomberg and to some extent over here and to some extent over here. But now, this was mine. This was my job. I had the capital. I wasn't starting from, from, from scratch. I was able to quickly, quickly ramp up in terms of my career, in terms of the work, in terms of the client base, because I had built my mastery to where I could not be ignored. Now, as I said, within this industry, to Kohen. So in addition to this, I've decided to specialize even further. So guess what? Specializing in emotional intelligence and leadership. And particularly this emotional intelligence. Now again, that kind of narrows the field. We're not that many of us who are teaching EI in this particular market. But I'm able to go to clients who I've dealt with in developing some of these skills and say to them, let me come and train your sales team to become emotionally intelligent salespeople. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm ramping up my specialization, I'm niching, I'm building my career capital, and I want to become autonomous. And then finally, there's one more leg in this journey where I am starting right now to get qualifications, if I could have the next slide, um, working on the next qualification, which is a, how do I put this? It is a skill in terms of training that only six people on the continent of Africa are qualified for. And I'm gonna leave it there. I, I, it's, it's so specialized. It's only in a certain number of countries, by the way. But bringing it here to Kenya, I'm going to be able to go into a company and say, you know what, fork over, name your figure for me to train you guys on this special skill. So you understand where I'm going with that sort of specialization. Okay. Uh, let me move on, and uh, again, just in terms of talking about, and if you can hit just the next five slides, I get to choose my clients, so that's sort of the autonomy that I get, that's the freedom that I have. If I don't want to work with you, I'm not gonna work with you. I don't have to chase every single thing I get. People call me and instill in this business and say, Derek, we'll give you 5,000 shillings to come and train our team for one day. And I'm like, I don't even respond to that, just click, because I, <laughs> First of all, it's an insult. What we do up here is, believe me, I'm sweating here like a dog. But also, I'm specialized. I get to charge a premium. That's what I do. And I'm able to narrow my client list because, you know what? I'm not for everybody. I've sent my proposals and guys, they just go quiet. I know immediately what that means. Guys, I've looked at this thing and they said, you see how much this guy is charging? Huh? <laughs> quiet. You don't even hear back from them. But there's some clients who appreciate that. And that's able to be able to keep me in business. Um, I don't have to go to the office every day, so I have a dedicated team, that's great. Um, but my, I get to do what I want. I wake up when I want, I go work out, I start now perhaps working on things I love, doing a little bit more of research on some of these areas, developing some of these skills, which make me so good that they can't ignore me. Okay, um, let's just keep going. There's a picture there of a gentleman, and I wonder if anybody knows who this is. A thousand shillings to the person without Googling who can tell me who this gentleman is. <laughs> Freud is a good guess. Van Gogh is a good guess. He, I, I, we're done with the guessing, okay. His name is Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel. Now Alfred Nobel, I think most of you know, is the person who is behind the Nobel Peace Prize. But did you know that Alfred Nobel, for many years, built his fortune, and he was a, literally a billionaire. He built his fortune from doing what? From creating dynamite. As the rapid industrialization in the 19th century was taking place in Europe, Alfred Nobel began selling dynamite to these companies that needed to take down rock faces, that needed to be able to carve past through forests. And the easiest and quickest way than using hand labor was simply to place a stick of dynamite and it became easy. And he became so successful. But one day, he walked into a restaurant, and he opened up the newspaper, and he read his own obituary. And the obituary said, the merchant of death is dead. Alfred Nobel, in inventing dynamite, had become the merchant of death. Because you know what dynamite was now being used for? It was being used for war and not for industrial expansion. And people were so upset. In fact, they said that Alfred Nobel was responsible for killing more people in human history at that time than anybody else. He read his own obituary, and he decided, 
Um, clearly, that's not my legacy. I want to build a legacy for myself. And that legacy he decided to build was to donate his billions of money towards the Nobel Peace Prize. And that's what we know him for 100 plus years later. He turned this around. In fact, nobody relates Alfred Nobel to dynamite, death, destruction. In fact, he's known as the person who's behind the Nobel Peace Prize. He wrote his own future. Now, I said that story just to give you some incentive because there's an exercise I'd like you to do. I want you to imagine that it is February the 15th, 2025. So five years from today. But I want you to do this, and I'm really into mindfulness and how you use your body and think and some of the exercises that were done by the previous speakers. So put both feet on the ground. I want you to put your hands comfortably where they are in your lap, but you're going to write. And I sort of want you to start thinking. We can go one slide forward. February 15, 2025. I want you to think about your career as it is right now and where you want your career to be based on the expertise that you have right now. In other words, what can you do as a web designer? What can you do as a cameraman? What can you do as a yoga instructor? That in five years, you're so good, you've built that capital, you have created this niche, you have specialized that people can't ignore you and built all of these things we're talking about. And I want you to write down Write down where you're going to be in 2025. Where do you see your career? Where do you see your career or your role? Or maybe you've decided I'm going to go back and I'm actually really going to build my talent as a fitness instructor because that's truly where it lies and I need to start building that social capital from there. Okay? So just write that down and make it come to pass. And we're almost done, guys. I apologize for taking so long. Okay, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to go to my last slide. Uh, guys, I just want you to be, that's where I am right now. I, I, I mean, I am. I'm, <laughs> I have that freedom. I'm living my best life. By the way, it's not all rosy, trust me. There are days I get up and I'm like, I don't want to do this. There are days I get up and I'm like, you know what, I, I can't deal with that particular client. But overall, I think that the specialization has helped me where I am. And this is truly where my freedom and my passion lies and my final slide is just one that's going to show you my contact information so thank you very much for giving me your attention Santa Sana. <laughs>